Good afternoon, everyone. So happy to see you all again and to get to spend a little lunchtime chat with you all. It feels as if we were just together about a month ago. We were together about a month ago. We were celebrating Black History Month. And this month, we're back to talk about the amazing impact of women. Um, and of course, not just the impact of women and the impact of women on the workforce and the impact of women in our society, but, but in particular, the historic impact of the pandemic on women in the workforce. And as we know, the, the, the causes, um, well, there are a number of causes of the, as it's been termed, the she session and the role that women have played in the world's steady recovery. And now, essentially, we're trying to figure out what are women demanding amidst the great resignation? What are the barriers? What's what's happening in the world um, of workforce and particularly the, the role that women play, play in it? And I am so excited to announce that my guest today is Felicia Davis Blakely, who is the president and CEO of the Chicago Foundation for Women. And I could spend way too much time talking about the number of ways that Felicia is amazing and blazing a trail for equity as it pertains to women. But let me turn it over to you, Felicia. Just share a little bit of your background with us and what brings you to your work and particularly your work focused on, on women. Oh, Kathleen, thank you. You're so kind. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me here. Uh, your team has been great to work with. Um, and I'm excited for this conversation because it's what I talk about every day. And I know we only have a little bit of time. Um, I'm president of Chicago Foundation for Women. I've been here for nearly three years. We fund organizations that are on the front lines, that are grassroots, that are led by women of color, that are supporting women um, in a lot of ways, um, even before, I mean, obviously before the pandemic. So last year we gave out $3.2 million in grants to support access to health and health information, freedom from gender-based violence, as well as economic security and opportunity for women. Um, the reason why I do this work, um, my gender notwithstanding, is because I really do believe, um, I've seen it myself through lived experience, that when you invest in women and girls, you really do help change our communities. And that happens to be uh, the mission of Chicago Foundation for Women. So I'm happy. I'm holding the baton right now. I think about these organizations, Kathleen, as you know, I'm the person holding the baton right now. And one day I pass that baton on to somebody else. And so I'm a woman in a long chain of, of women who are really working for uh, gender equity and also racial justice. I love it. And and so, so astutely noted. And thank you for sharing that. And, you know, as you, as you talk about the, the moment that we're in, it's, it's been almost two years, right, since the pandemic began. And at its onset, we, we've seen the stats in March 2020. We know the rates at which women began leaving or losing their jobs in the workforce. And it was pretty alarming, right? 55% of the 20.5 million jobs lost in April 2020 were held by women. And by May 2020, which was a month later, the Institute for Women's Policy Research then declared that this was a she session, which but that, that phrase has become much more uh, popular at this point. And this is the term really to underscore the pandemic's impact on the economy particularly, and comparing it to the gravity of the 2008 recession that now specifically and disproportionately impacted women of color. So I know that one of the Chicago Foundation for Women's Priorities is supporting and advocating, as you just mentioned, for women's opportunity, economic stability. What, what are some of the key reasons that you all have found and are still that women still are being forced out of the workforce in response to the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, this is um, a really important point. And I have to say, you know, a lot of people are talking about, oh, let's get back to normal, let's get back to normal. And the reality is normal wasn't working for a lot of working women prior to COVID, for most working women, in fact. Just a couple of stats. Yesterday was equal pay day. You know, we're sitting here in March, Women's History Month, March 8th was International Women's Day. Yesterday was equal pay day for 2022. Um, and so white women make 83 cents for every dollar that white men make. Black women earn 63 cents, and for Indigenous women, that falls to 60%. 
And then for Latino women, that falls to 55%. So part of why we find ourselves here today is what was existing prior, really these inequities that were already existing, because your ability to withstand the economic impacts of the pandemic really um, go back to how much um, money your family, you and your family were bringing in and, you know, whether or not you were able to accumulate savings and, you know, or wealth that could then protect you from not being able to work for a long time. But as we sit here today, even, you know, a lot of women, over a million women still haven't recovered, um, haven't returned to the workforce. And that's the women who are still looking, right? There is a huge, we know that the way the jobs numbers, the Department of Labor, the job numbers come out is that when a person stops looking for work, then they kind of fall out the equation. And part of the challenge here is that women have had to take on additional care responsibilities. Um, many working women are also caring for school age children, and some of them are also caring for aging parents or, you know, other family members. Well, with COVID, um, with schools, you know, having intermittent closures, and that required a lot of flexibility. And some of that flexibility just has not been built into into uh, work, into companies, into the way that they operate on a daily basis. I mean, everybody flexed for the time that we had um, the remote, the orders, stay-at-home orders in, in, in place, but a lot of those uh, flexible options have disappeared, and consequently, we find ourselves here where a lot of women are still not, haven't returned to participating in the labor force. That and it's and we're still facing some of those some of those impacts, right? And you talked a lot just now about some of the um, the the individual and familial impacts of the result of women being forced out of the workforce. How how have families and so we've talked about families? How has the economy been impacted by losing women in the workforce? Well, you know, at the outset, I have to say we all saw how the economy responded. I mean, so before the pandemic, so January, and I always have to like count on my fingers, January, 2020. So prior to remote or uh, shelter in place orders, women had just out edged men as far as total workforce participation. There were more women in the workforce than there were men for the first, like for the first time, this was a pretty significant thing. We've lost those gains. And the fear is that because this has been so sustained that we may lose, that we may never, you know, it may take a couple of generations for us to kind of gain that back. So when you look at like how, um, you know, different sectors kind of performed, you know, hospitality, uh, there was a, a study that put out that said the hospitality sector was 51% uh, um, women. And we saw early on that that was essentially decimated, right? I mean, our whole economy, if you think about it, literally came to a standstill because there was no child care. There was, you know, think about all of the working families. Think about all the women in the workforce. Think about the type of uh, flexibility that's required to make that happen. And we literally came to a standstill and had an economic downturn, in part because we could not, we, you know, we could not actively participate in the, in the labor force. And now that things have started to open up again, there are these lingering effects, right? I just talked about pay inequity as one of them. And the state of Illinois, I mean, where we are, we still have a sub-minimum wage. The sub-minimum tipped wage, tipped wage workers make $6.60 an hour. Um, and so we're part of a coalition, one fair wage, pushing for all workers. You know, we will say at the outset, $15 minimum wage is a floor, not the ceiling um, for working families and for working women. I And let's stick with that for a moment, because when I think about the work that we do at Kara Collective, we are clearly focused on helping people break the cycle of poverty, right, through gainful employment. And so when you, we think about the, the, the workforce, particularly women in the workforce, that, that's a very broad category. So I want to double click a little bit about the impact on low income women and women experiencing poverty. You know, when we talk about gender equity and we talk about um, equity for women in general, again, we're talking about a very, a very broad population. But what do you, when you think about the impact, impact specifically with women who are experiencing poverty, what is, what is, what are you seeing? Yeah, I pause for a minute because there was an, uh, uh, some alarms going by, fire, uh, fire Welcome truck went to by. Chicago. 
<laughs> background. It's just background music. Um, this is also an important point because, and I want to say this, at, I should say this at the outset, because I talk about this a great deal. I talk about the inequities and the pay gaps between men and women all the time. And I'm not coming for men. I want to, I want to make this clear. These inequities hurt us all. It hurts us all. And so if Chicago were world-class paying women and men equitably for the same work, we would have $58 billion more in GDP. That GDP, those salaries, those wages would really impact our families, our communities. So that includes, you know, uh, um, households where there are men present, where there's a, you know, a spouse, partner, um, um, who's also a male. And so it actually hurts us all. And so I say that to just be clear about this. This isn't just like, oh, if, you know, the women are trying to take something away from me. And then when it comes down to your, specifically to your question around low income uh, workers, which in many instances, because of um, job segregation that's just happened over time, the way women and men are kind of funneled differently into work and the conversations that we have about work. And it just happens that the jobs that are lower, lower paying, lower wage jobs, they're overly represented by women in the workforce. And so that means there is an overrepresentation of women, um, working women with families who are also in poverty. And it this, you know, during this time, this period of time, in many instances, these workers were deemed essential, right? These are, which is kind of, you know, these are the same workers that have been fighting just for a fair minimum wage. And at the same time, then they were deemed essential workers um, who were required to be out in force, um, who also then had to navigate things like childcare issues, like all of the things we talked about. These are the same workers who often don't have, these low wage workers often don't have benefits attached to them, which means that they don't have sick days. They may not have medical, often they don't have medical assurance. And so this, this sector, you know, women, um, many people in our immigrant community, um, women of color, this is the, the, the space where that, their intersectional identi identities really um, the, has been exacerbated. Like the, the, the implications for them have been exacerbated because of, you know, the lack of gender parity and also racial parity on, 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 on those issues. I, c I couldn't agree more. And when we think about, you know, uh, last month, we talked a little bit about intersectionality, right? And so thinking about not only when you have the gender inequities, then also having racial inequities, uh, class inequities as it pertains to, to poverty as well. And, you know, you mentioned you mentioned the the, the term essential, and, and I kind of want to come back to that a little bit, you know, in in the. Uh, very early in the pandemic in 2020, we there was some some census data that crossed the with the federal government's essential worker guidelines. We learned that one in three jobs, as you just mentioned, was held or one of the three jobs held by women, excuse me, was designated as essential. And non-white women are more likely to be doing the essential jobs than anyone else. And last year alone, if I can just brag about Chicago Foundation for Women, you supported 160 projects serving more than 70,000 women, girls, transgender, and gender non-binary people across the Chicago region. And since the pandemic began, thousands of those that you served, as you just noted, and maybe for the first time in their careers, were recognized as essential workers, right? We know that women make up nearly nine out of 10 nursing and nursing assistants. We know that more than two thirds of workers at grocery store checkouts and fast food counters are women. And, and perhaps even more starting, more than 52% of all workers deemed essential were women. Yes. And so the, we we know that we, we, you know, not surprised to us that women have always been and always will be essential. But obviously the pandemic helped, but why do you think the world started to change this narrative and recognize the essential work? And what what momentum do you think we can continue to gain from it? Yeah, I mean, I think um, recognizing the essential work is one thing, but then what comes with that essential work? If you're saying I'm an essential worker, there should also be some essential benefit. There should be like a rounding out of what that actually means. Um, and then that's something that I think all of us individually 
individuals and collectively need to wrestle with, right? I make a pledge. I receive care in my life and many of us receive care, you know, help with child care, house, all of the things, right? My mom, all of the care that's required that a working woman in my case requires to really help me be able to function in it. And because I make a pledge then that I will not be the reason why another woman is paid inequitably so that I value that care and I pay for that care. And so collectively then we all need to do that and and particularly for those persons who are not um, working for corporations or government um, or organizations because our homes are also you know CFW is part of a campaign with the city of Chicago to really illustrate the fact that um, sometimes your home is someone's workplace right and they're also they are uh, they should have respect and dignity as a rule. We had a conversation virtually, um, um, our team with some of our partners a couple of weeks ago where this was really an important point that each worker needs to have those things. And so then I goes back to your question about essential workers, right? So that respect and dignity certainly has to be there. But we also need to talk about the infrastructure that kind of makes that possible. So, you know, for the first time, um, everyone, I mean, CEOs of large cor Fortune 500 corporations, the president of the United States talked about uh, child care as infrastructure. It is essential infrastructure. And we saw what happened when our economy, we didn't have the provision of, of child care many. And also I think about all the places that are child care deserts, right? Because there are many communities where if you are, if you don't have a car and you already are using um, public transportation to get to work, you have to use that same public transportation to perhaps get to a child care center. And maybe now that child care center is further outside that further erodes your economic stability because now you're paying more just to participate um, in the work in the workplace, and those essential workers didn't get necessarily right additional benefits or additional income to really um, accommodate them. And in some respects, I, going back to the early days of the pandemic, and this is why we increased our grant funding. Um, thanks for talking about that. Many of those workers and many of the workers that on on the front lines and healthcare and many community organizations and and some nonprofits did not even have PP. Uh, personal protective equipment provided for them. And so if you also have to be your essential and you also had to buy your own PPE and all of those things, I mean, it really took a toll on the economic stability and the wages that those workers were earning. It's, uh, I, I imagine a, a uh, battle cry of essential workers deserve essential benefits. That so resonated with me and I know it resonated with others as well. And I think about the work, you know, that you're doing that, the work that um, Sharita Ellens is leading at Women Employed and the, and the work that we're doing here at Kara, the, the, the pieces that you talk about in terms of ensuring that there are supports to ensure a foundational stability, how are we, what are we doing to help remove some of the barriers to help, right? The, that, that is what's critical in this. And, and I, I know we can only imagine the world that we would be in without the endless contributions of, of essential workers in general, but particularly that of, of women. Uh, as we, one of the things that I want to do is think about what can we do, right? So we, we've sort of spent some time thinking about, thinking about the, the challenge and, you know, in one study, we've learned that working women are 23% more likely to burn out than men. So, and you talked a little bit about this, right? So after the last two years of managing childcare, education, career, or being forced out, being asked to leave the workforce altogether, it, it's not a surprise that women are reprioritizing how they want to live and work, which leads us to where we are today, right? The, the great resignation. And we have heard a lot about this. So speaking about some of those essential benefits that you just mentioned, you touched on a couple, but maybe we could stick there for just a moment. How do we make systemic change to support women and especially women of color and women experiencing poverty in the workplace? What are those kinds of benefits so that they can thrive? What does that look like? Oh, absolutely. And I want to, and I want to, you touched on something. I just want to make this because it's blown my mind because this, this hasn't happened before. There was a recent survey and 30% of workers will leave a job without having another job lined up. This is the point. This is part of the contribution to the great resignation, right? They will leave a job without, and that hasn't happened any time 
uh, in our history prior to now. And so there are some key things. I mean, we're having this conversation um, beyond the, sh the she session. And I want to say at Chicago Foundation for Women, last fall, we um, unveiled uh, what's the response or what should be the antidote for a she session. We launched She Covery. So She Covery is a trademarked mm -hmm. initiative um, where we're really focusing on some of these pillars, right? One of them is all about getting women back to work, what it takes to get women back to work, right? And some of that is, you know, you want to you want to bring women back to work, you want to retain the workers that you have, pay equity, flexible schedule, pay leave, and that includes sick leave, parental leave, whatever's possible, growth and professional development opportunities, listening to employees, right? This isn't about a one size fits all. I uh, talked to a corporation the other day, a local company here is at their headquarters. And I said to them, you know, part of this requires, it's just really listening to your employees because every organization has a different mix of employees. And also um, that means maybe a different mix of some of the needs that they have. Um, and then a lot of women, and I've done this a couple of times myself, you know, I started off in the Chicago Police Department, I've worked um, at City Hall and at other places, um, pivoting in their career. So a lot of women are also pivoting in their career, which means you, you know, affirming the skill sets that you have, there are transferable skills, you know, there is leanin.org has done research and it talks about the fact that there are a couple, I mean, you know, I'd say there are a couple of issues with the way women are hired and promoted. And a couple is, you know, hiding a lot of sins. But two big things that really hang, uh, hang out or stick out for me are that men are often hired for uh, and promoted for their future potential. Mm. Um, and women, unfortunately, have those, those additional barriers of having had to done, have done, executed every, every little detail of a job description. And companies and corporations are much more willing to take a chance on men. You know, providing mentors and helping um, mentor, you know, I recently wrote a piece in my president's, uh, every year, every month I write a president's letter for a newsletter. And I talked about the fact that mentoring is really important. And a lot of people of color report that they do not have access to mentorship. And that's really important. Um, and also the other pillar of she covery is addressing the eviction crises. We know that a lot of the additional, um, um, benefits, um, that were started during the pandemic has started to, to be, dissipate. Um, and, and yet there is still this crisis that's happening right in front of us right now. And so, you know, we do work in funding organizations, you know, locally, like Lawyers Committee for Better Housing and others that really help to um, address this issue, um, caring for our caregivers. And I know I've already touched on this a little bit, but I cannot um, really talk about that enough. It's, you know, even before the pandemic, our society was really held together by caregivers. And, and right. often, as I said, these are women of color, members of our immigrant community who are often underpaid um, or unpaid. Sometimes that care isn't valued. Um, they're on the front lines fighting for our families, really. And so we have to make sure that we care for them. And then demanding an anti-racist healthcare system. Prior to the pandemic, the state of Illinois had just enacted um, a couple of laws, and one of them required implicit, implicit bias training for healthcare workers. An equitable recovery has to also include a healthy recovery and what that looks like for all of our communities. And, you know, famously, you know, just on one front, you know, Beyonce and Serena, who are, I don't even have to say, I don't even have to say any more than those two names, right? But these are women who are like the two of the most photographed and most recognized women in the world, two of the most wealthiest women in the world. And yet they also encountered this bias in the healthcare system. And so COVID has also highlighted that as well. And so part of this uh, for us, as we see it, is these are four things to really help um, get our economy moving in the right place and really help to support an equitable recovery. And in our estimation, it's a she recovery. I love it. And, and I think one of the things that you highlighted was just how inextricably linked all of these challenges and issues are. And I'm just um, in awe of the work that you're doing to, to, to really get there. Um, one of the things that you mentioned is the idea of mentorship and the idea of the kinds of advanced roles that women are or aren't being um, recognized for. When we think about the number of qualified women that we have to fill leadership roles, we, we know, according to research, that women outnumber men in earning bachelor's, master's degrees. They're nearly on par with medical and legal, legal degrees. But in 
the, one of the most recent McKinsey and Company's um, women in workforce studies, we found that, or they found rather, that women are still being left behind, accounting for nearly 21% of C-level roles. Mm -hmm. And of that 21%, women of color only make up 4%. Mm -hmm. What are the additional, when we think about leadership roles and we think about advancement, which is something that we talk often about here, even at Care Collective, right? It's getting folks to a job, but thinking about how, what are we, what is, what are the pathways for them to continue to advance in those roles? What are those barriers that are preventing women from rising to the highest levels of leadership? And what barriers, maybe you can talk even a little personally, that you've had to overcome even along your journey? Yeah. So this is the million dollar question. Maybe it's more than a million dollars. Um, and it's really important. And I know that a lot of companies struggle with this. And I know some companies, I'm just being honest, I'm a very uh, transparent, can you know, I give candor. Uh, some companies are saying they're struggling with it, but they're not really trying that hard. So let's just be, let's just be clear. Some people are doing it better than others, but let's just start with in the workplace, women in the workplace want the same thing that every, that men want, that other people want, right? Respect and dignity are non-negotiable. That's first and foremost. Then we've already, I've already covered equal pay. Um, and as far as mentorship, you know, there's mentorship and then there's sponsorship. If, you know, they're, um, are things that happen in the in the realm of corporate work and other work where you know like golfing or other things that could be like male only domains um there are career paths that seem to be male only domains i have worked in a couple of those areas you know as i said i was a police officer violent crimes detective um i spent 10 years with the chicago police department it's a very male dominated field and i've had some barriers you know i had a a, a male um, um, supervisor, he was a lieutenant who I think thought he was being well-meaning, say to me at one point, like, oh, you don't want to do, I wanted an assignment. I wanted to do an assignment. And this assignment is really a, an area where people didn't get promoted. And so I'd worked really hard to like earn the ability to go into that assignment. And he said to me, oh, no, 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 no. You, you know, you're a nice girl. That, that, that's irrelevant. You have a nice family. You don't want to do that assignment. And in his mind, he was being well-meaning, but what he really was doing was he was hurting my ability to um, get promoted. He was hurting my chances, right. And blocking me from an opportunity. And so in some respects, that's a bias. So there, there are still biases in the workplace. Um, and as you said, you know, I think we've both talked about the lean and org report. It talks about that a great deal. The biases about what women can and cannot do. You know, it also goes back to earlier um, in, high, in, in education and the ways in which we talk about and the exposure that we give to um, women and girls about all types of career fields. And so that's something that if we want to really want to see change, we can start very early in a young woman or a young girl's life, right? Women are told like they're they're pushy or bossy and, and boys are often told that they are assertive and that they, you know, like we have to change the narrative and the language and the way that we talk to boys and girls as well. And so there are a lot of different, there's no like one thing, right? And even in our homes, starting in our homes, really, we need to, we need to not fall into these gendered roles. You know, in my home, you know, I have four sons and I will say I raised four feminist sons and I have a daughter. And in our home, everyone had chores and responsibilities. It did not fall to one gender, one, you know, so everyone knew how to cook. Everyone knew how to do laundry. Everyone had a responsibility for cleaning. But then that also then supports, if there's a working mother in that family, that supports, supports her ability then to work, get promoted without having, you know, those additional burdens of caregiving. Uh, absolutely. And I think if, so you're saying if we're if we're teaching our younger generations coming up how to think about uh, equality as it pertains to gender, then we're, we're, we're helping to solve that problem for, for the future. Um, in our last couple of minutes, I can't believe the time is already gone. What what advice would you give to uh, women, particularly women of color, trying to rise into levels of leadership or just trying to um, really find their place in, in the workforce, what kind of advice would you, would you give? You know, honestly, I would say, um, have a real good assessment of your skills. I mean, just, you know, know what you do well, 
I would say also seek feedback. It's unfortunate, and I think this falls into some of the categories around bias, that women and often women of color are not given valuable feedback early in their careers that could actually help them. And if you are not getting feedback, um, we should all be getting feedback all the time. Like it should be happening all the time. And if there is none, that simply means that they're not investing in you to actually help you. And some of the reasons that people do that is they feel uncomfortable, you know, to have those conversations. So if you're not getting that, seek that out because that will help. You don't know what you don't know. And you may often, you know, women don't get that feedback until they're leaving an organization, but it hasn't done anything to help them. Um, to be successful in the organization and then advocate inside the company for those things or your organization, but also look outside. There are lots of organizations, Chicago Foundation for Women and other places where you can work on some skill. We have a skill and skill development, your leadership. We have women's leadership development um, opportunities here. Um, Willie's Warriors, Cultivate. And so there are a number of ways in which you can also augment the skill set that you have. Um, and, and don't self-censor. Don't shut yourself down and say, oh, no, they're never going to pick me for that. Raise your hand and go. I've stepped out on faith a lot. And the first time you do it, it's really, really scary. And it gets less scary every chance, after, every step after that. Absolutely. And, and you talked about all of the ways that, and I love that, the, the, all of those pieces of advice. I'm ta- I took some notes myself. Um, and so, you know, you talked about ways that individuals can get involved and you shared about the work that Chicago Foundation for Women, for Women is doing with the She Covery Initiative. And, and I would say even at the employer level, uh, something that we're doing at CARA Collective with our uh, CARA Plus arm is helping to advise ways on way they, they can deepen their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, which we know includes uh, gender equity. Um, and want to just make a, a quick plug for, for folks to check out our Inclusion Action Labs, which can help those cohorts think about how to address some of these challenges and make the workforce much more welcoming and accessible uh, for, for women. So thank you so much, Felicia Davis-Blakely, for joining us today and for sharing your thoughts. We are so grateful to have your leadership in Chicago, um, and we are so so thrilled that you were able to spend your time with us today. And thank you all for watching as well. And Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.